in our quest to capture more power from the wind, does the answer lie in networks of giant wind farms or in a revolutionary new kind of turbine? Or might the real solution lie up in the stratosphere with this lone inventor's unique vision to change the way we power our world? What will the future look like? And who are the people inventing it? Brilliant thinkers, cutting-edge research, backyard inventors on the very fringes of science. This is where tomorrow is born. This is Innovation Nation. The wind. Powerful, unpredictable and sometimes devastating. But if we can find a way to tame it, to truly harness its full potential, it could actually provide us with all of our energy needs many times over. It's an energy goliath, green and renewable, capable of lighting every city, powering every electric car. We're going on an unconventional journey in search of the future of wind power. And the future is often born in the most unlikely of places. This is Boron, California, population 2,000. A sleepy town on the edge of the Mojave Desert. There are no million dollar science labs here. This quiet compound on the edge of town may actually be ground zero for an idea that changes our entire planet. The birthplace of the next Microsoft of wind power. Meet Doug Selson a self-taught inventor with big dreams of the world to come. As everybody knows, if we're dependent on fossil fuels right now, there is a limited supply of fossil fuels. We're going to need some way to get affordable electricity and power, and the wind will provide as much of that as we could ever use. All we really need to do is reach up and grab it. Despite a lack of research funding, Doug lives and breathes wind power. Every inch of his small apartment is crowded with his plans to change the future. For so many years I wondered, well, how can I ever get to really be an inventor? I mean, you can't really go to school where they have inventor school or something where somebody teaches you out. At some point you have to realize, hey, I've got ideas that nobody else has and the only way to pursue it is to actually pursue it. You know, I've got more types of wind turbine patented than anyone in the world. I've got patents all over the world, okay? I mean, here's a stack of my patents so far. His biggest brainstorm, a rethinking of traditional wind turbine design, a design that hasn't changed in over a thousand years. Traditional turbines place a single rotor on a fixed pedestal. Today's versions eat up massive amounts of material and mechanics. They're expensive and take up plenty of real estate, key hurdles facing the wider spread of wind power. Doug's plan is to change all that. The spark of the idea came to me when I was a teenager. And the idea was, if one propeller is good, more propellers might be better. My vision is that the wind turbine of the future will not have just one propeller. At his test site in Boron, Doug has assembled a number of small, multi-prop turbines, each one a work of ingenuity. But today, he will build and test his biggest invention yet, a version of something he calls a super turbine, capable of going where no turbine has gone before. By using multiple propellers that share one drive shaft, this turbine should harness more wind for the amount of material used than traditional turbines. We've got the generator here. This is just a bearing. This is a long drive shaft. In the past, it had been inadvisable to try to put a second propeller downwind from a first propeller because the first propeller obviously is blocking the wind. My innovation was to provide sufficient spacing between the propellers and sufficient offset angle of the drive shaft direction from the wind direction so the wind can sneak inside and get into each rotor. We can literally use one-tenth of the material to get the same power using super turbine technology. We can span impossible terrain rather than worrying about trying to build roads in there and disturbing the ecosystem. So in effect, with two stations, we can put an entire wind farm stretched across a mountain pass. And what we've basically got here is the next step in wind energy. 
If Doug plans to revolutionize the wind power industry, the super turbine has to perform. Loaded up with fiberglass drive shafts, Doug makes his way to the machine shop to pick up some custom-made hubs. Then it's off to the test site in Boron to assemble his invention. If it works, the super turbine could span canyons or mountain passes. But for now, this smaller 120-foot prototype will be tested between two fixed points on the compound. Doug has decided on seven-foot spacing for the blades. Too far apart and potential wind power will blow right through. Too close together and the blades will block one another out. The beauty of this design is its simplicity. Unlike traditional turbines, it has no gearbox or complex mechanics. It has only one moving part, a flexible drive shaft connected directly to a generator. Essentially what we're doing right now is we're gonna tilt up that tower that you can see down at the far end there. And when we tilt that tower up, that end will be 40 feet in the air. Probably the worst case scenario would be we don't get any wind. Nothing like this has ever been done before, so we're totally treading into the unknown here. We're, we're going on a, a little bit of faith here. Faith in their design, and faith that the wind will blow when they need it. Hoping to revolutionize the way we harness wind power, Doug Selsom is ready to lift up the prototype of his super turbine, a device he believes is 10 times more efficient than the world's largest traditional turbines. Afterwards, he will launch another amazing device called the Sky Serpent, deemed to be the invention of the year by Popular Mechanics magazine. The Sky Serpent is one version of the super turbine uh, that flies. We've mounted this whole generator frame assembly onto the front of this boom that's mounted on the front of our test truck, and we're about to tilt it up as we drive the truck forward. We're gonna tilt up the tower on the other end, and we're just gonna see what this thing looks like in the air now. Dollar. With everyone in place, some delicate give and take between Doug's van and Norman's truck gradually gets the job done. High above the test site and carefully angled so that each blade is exposed to the elements, this super turbine is finally ready for testing. But after all their hard work, one key ingredient is suddenly missing in action. Problem is right now, we really have no wind. Frustrating thing about wind energy, we, when you don't have wind, it doesn't work. Mother Nature has returned with a prevailing wind, and Doug Selsom's super turbine is set free on its maiden spin. All 20 rotors work together to produce a steady stream of electricity to the small generator. Doug is convinced that we're looking at the cheapest but most efficient turbine in the world. This model is confirmation, one more confirmation that the concept in general works. This is the biggest one yet. It's operating smoothly. Things are looking real good. This is 120 feet. I think to make it 10 times as long would be no problem whatsoever. I eventually go from mountaintop to mountaintop, maybe a few miles long. With the stationary test successful, Doug is now ready to see if he can take his invention into the sky. The wind energy really is a completely sky-based activity and these steel towers that can push maybe two, three hundred feet up into the sky, great to get us where we are today, but we're looking at the 21st century here with a big push toward green energy. I think if we seriously want to grab wind energy out of the sky, let's go up into the sky where the real wind energy is. Like the Cross Canyon version, the Sky Serpent has a single drive shaft turned by a series of rotors. It truly has only one moving part. But unlike his Cross Canyon version, one end won't be connected to a fixed point on the ground. Instead, it will be lifted skyward by a collection of helium balloons. 
we're in final assembly of our drive shaft here. I've got one more set screw to put in, and then we're going to be ready to start filling balloons with helium and elevating this end of the drive shaft. This end of the drive shaft will be about 30 degrees into the sky. The whole thing's going to spin together. All the propellers spin the drive shaft together, and they're going to spin that generator right there on top of the truck. The team attaches a total of six large helium balloons to get the floating end of the Sky Serpent into the perfect position above the desert. With everything set, Doug prepares to unlock the drive shaft. That's good, right there. Okay. Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one. The test flight goes off without a hitch. The beauty of the super turbine lies in its simplicity and efficiency. Okay, we see traditional turbines in the background. Today's a light wind day. They may be using power as much as making power. It's hard to really say. It's a light wind day. And I'd say our machine here, we're probably making about one kilowatt as opposed to the three kilowatts it's capable of. Uh, essentially what we have here is a demo that the technology works. This is the first flying wind turbine in the world, and there it is, it's in the air, it's producing power, it's spinning this generator. We envision rather than an 80-foot drive shaft, we might get to an 800-foot drive shaft next, maybe an 8,000-foot long drive shaft, and at some point we'll be up into the trade winds and then the stratosphere where they have uh, 120 mile an hour winds the majority of the time. It's these kind of winds that Doug Selsom hopes to one day go after. 20 years from now, I, I think we're gonna, you're going to see wind farms across the vast open plains, uh, everywhere from Mongolia to the Midwest of the United States to California here, possibly underwater out in the ocean. You're going to see super turbine arrays everywhere. Um, I don't think people will still be manufacturing single rotor turbines once this takes hold. If the wind truly has a chance of becoming the planet's primary power source in the decades to come, Perhaps the tipping point will involve a combination of new designs and innovations. Large-scale wind farms may eventually incorporate new turbine designs that harness the wind cheaply and more efficiently on a massive commercial scale. And finding a good way to store the wind would allow us to rely on this clean, renewable power source like never before. I mean, it's always going to be there. The wind is never going to stop. We're always going to have it. And so we don't, we don't need to worry about running out of wind. And it's clean. All we really need to do is reach up and grab it.